Brigadier indicated that it would be necessary to shoot some members of the G Division. We need men who aren't going to flinch. When it's the idea of an individual, uh, a group of individuals setting out to assassinate a policeman was quite new and quite shocking. After the Brigadier's address, most of those present refused to give an affirmative answer. The G men, of course, were Dubliners. They lived among the civilian population. These were family men. Some stated that such work would be contrary to their consciences, that while they were prepared to carry out acts of open warfare, they wouldn't shoot a man down unwarned. Enough men, though, were prepared to follow Collins' orders without question. They became known as the squad. The ideal squad member was somebody who was in their early 20s and was able to leave his uh, full-time employment and work full-time for the squad. Most of them came from North Dublin, North inner city Dublin. Vinnie Byrne, he was only 14 when he was, uh, I think, joined into 1916. I don't for one minute think that Vinnie Byrne had no conscience. Of course he had. He, he was a soldier, if you like, and he just did it. Charles Dalton, he's a very young person. He obviously looks older. He manages to inveigle his way into the volunteer movement, and he obviously has a capacity to carry out assassinations. Paddy Daly is one of the rarities in the squad in that he had a family. He was a widower and had three children, but is very prominent within the squad and very respected. This squad would take orders directly from Michael Collins. We were told never to discuss our movements or actions with volunteer officers or with anybody else. We had a list of enemy agents who were to be eliminated. Had you been a betting man in 1919, you would have said that the DMP would wipe the floor with, with Collins. They had no training in this. Uh, Vinnie Byrne told me himself, you know, that he had uh, no idea of uh, winning or even of losing. They were just young fellas wanting to have a go. The government sent a letter to the DMP that they better take their G-men off the political activity or that they were going to get it. And, of course, naturally, they ignored it. First of all, he tries to scare off the less resolute of the G-men. The squad took them down laneways and they beat the daylights out of them and made them promise they would not do it anymore. The hardcore of the G-men would not desist from their activities. And then it became a matter of executing them. And this really is, for many of the squad, their personal Rubicon. Once you're in and once you are uh, implicated in death, murder, destruction, it is extremely difficult to get out. As the date of the first execution of G-Men approaches, people with Collins notice he becomes very tense and apprehensive, and he's just wondering how this will go down with the Irish public. Can they cross over this and actually execute someone up close and personal? Really gruesome. I mean, you have the smell of burning flesh up close. It's a messy business. They had roles. One man would shoot the man, put him down, then the other would come and finish him off. They give you the low down on agents as spies, and you just went and rubbed them out. Let them have it, then run like hell. <laughs> One had to get practically within touching distance, certainly within point-blank range, in order to take out the enemy. To hear them scream, a cry out for their mummy. Two or three more shots rang out. And he fell on his knee. And he says, what did they do to deserve this? Once you shot the, uh, the first detective, you had to pause and wait and see how public opinion, wait till after the funeral, for example, and the masses and that kind of thing. When the first G-man is shot, he's intrigued and relieved that the reaction is mutual in relation to the volunteers. There's an increasing frustration in the ranks of the Irish public and mounting cynicism about British intentions. So Collins is tapping into a substantial well of public disillusionment. The attacks continued throughout the year. The squad may have been the cutting edge, but the real strength of the Dublin IRA lay elsewhere. 
in an audacious intelligence gathering operation run from an innocuous city center office. In terms of secrecy, Crow Street was the holy of holies. Only a handful of people knew of its existence. Well, Crow Street was just an office in Crow Street, deliberately and provocatively chosen, right in the shadow of Dublin Castle. So really what it was was a front. The members of the intelligence department arrived for work, dressed in business suits. They kept regular office hours. Inside, of course, it was very different. Intelligence had been built up gradually. So Liam Tobin had been in charge of intelligence under Michael Collins and had been gradually building up um, staff around him. Cold Street is run by a 24-year-old Cork man called Liam Tobin, a very intense, nervous man who always seemed to be wrapped just a bit too tight. My grandfather and Frank Thornton, they kept business to themselves. They um, had loyalty to each other. I mean, it was a very tight ship. They were very good at doing th mundane things, like going through Tom's directory and getting the addresses of people where they lived. In our office on Crow Street, I was given the daily paper to look through. I was told to cut out any paragraphs referring to police or military, such as transfers, attendance at wedding receptions, garden parties, etc. One of our greatest sources of information were the society columns of newspapers. That was a revolutionary technique that didn't strike people beforehand. Surveillance through photography was important. Say a photograph on Ho's head where you see it, it's just, you know, it's a soldier just relaxing with, uh, with two women. So they obviously, the double agent, I presume, has said, well, let's just take a photograph. Or they're in the back of a hotel relaxing, you know, welcome to Ireland, sit down, have a photograph, you know, everything's fine. Again, it seems so innocent but then you find that the IRA are collecting all this information and building up these files. It was a grim centre of a very grim business where a group of young men were perfecting a new form of warfare. A fundamental weakness of British rule in Ireland was that through sheer necessity, of course, they had to rely on the native population for much of the day-to-day -day administration of Ireland. We started seriously to get the names of all the personnel of all the various departments in Dublin Castle that would be of use to us. We had not alone one or two or three here, but we had dozens. Collins had people uh, working in the various military barracks typing up Colonel so-and-so's uh, orders. And before the orders, when the Colonel would reach the unit, who was being directed to go out that night and conduct a, you know, a search operation, the carbon copy would be on its way to Crow Street. For centuries, British intelligence had used informers to suppress rebellion. Now, the tables were being turned. To get into intelligence, to get into the secret service, that was the object. One of the classic examples of that was uh, David Nelligan. David Nelligan was one of a number of individuals who Collins recruited at various different points. Collins persuaded him to enter the G-men, uh, precisely to act as his mole. And along with others, he provided information. I met Fry, McNamara and Kavanagh on a new footing because they were working for Michael Collins. They taught me so themselves, and I was accepted with the same status. Collins was absolutely central. He was the only one with the big picture. He was the only one that knew exactly who was working for him. The British response to the threat posed by Collins in Dublin, and indeed by the IRA activities elsewhere in Ireland, was, was slow. The British don't know who is running this campaign. Their whole mission is to find out who are the leaders of the volunteers. With G Division reeling, intelligence chiefs in London comb their books for agents willing to infiltrate the IRA. Almost by chance, 
one unlikely spy hit the jackpot on his first attempt. The 